Hello Turkaholics and thank you for downloading this episode of Football a la Turka. We hope you enjoy our podcast and the work we put into bringing it to you each and every week completely free. But for those of you who want to support the show, you can join us on Patreon for just $3 a month. Money we'll use to continue improving our hardware, software and fund our annual hosting on Podbean. You can do so on patreon.com slash F-A-L-T or just check the show notes. Thank you for your consideration of patronage and enjoy the show. Hello Turkaholics and welcome to another episode of Football a la Turka. This is episode, this is season 2, episode 7 and my name is Kam Bayezit. I'm joined once again by Umut Nadre and the man of the law, Burak Sizgin. Hello, 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 hello. I am coming straight off a birthday. So it's, I guess it's my fault you're, we're getting this episode a little bit later than you would have expected, uh, dear Turkaholics. Um, so forgive me, the old man had to go out and, and celebrate with uh, a nice half pint and bowl of pasta. But we are back. A half oh. pint and a bowl of pasta, that's a wild celebration right there. Umut, uh, Umut Burak, were you eating that like at the bottom of a stripper or something? Uh, or like a sushi girl, pasta, um, pasta girl. I, I, uh, no, 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 none of those disgusting ideas. I'm sure um, if Ezra was in town, he would have taken me to some establishment like that. But no, I, I went out with my mother um, for a nice, just quiet oh. last. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> good thing, good thing no you didn't sh- have a sushi girl. Did, did you ever see that movie with Mark Hamill, Sushi Girl? No, but I want to now. It's a good, good, it's a good film. It doesn't get great ratings, but it's. Uh, I enjoyed it. It was good. Um, should definitely give it a watch. It's, it came out a couple of years ago, and uh, yeah, Luke Skywalker is unrecognizable in that movie. I can tell you. Uh, Umut, how's your first week of uh, university in the UK? Well, I'm getting used to it. It's fine. Yeah, did you? Uh, did you? Were you forced in a lot of uh, drinking games by your fellow uh, students? Yes, exactly. Uh, the penny game was the surprising one, obviously, because they threw a penny inside your glass and expect you to finish the whole pine. <laughs> oh, poor you. Uh, well, <laughs> Burak, happy birthday to you, my friend. Yeah, happy birthday. And. Uh, yeah. Thanks, how guys. How how young are you now, Burak? How old are you now? <laughs> Let's take guesses. The first person to guess it correctly on Twitter will win a prize yet to be determined. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. So people, go and uh, tweet at fo- Footy Alaturka and guess Burak's age. And apparently you're getting a prize if you guess it right. The first person to guess it right. <laughs> You heard it here first, folks. It's going to be like a, a, a personal ballad or something by Burak, I, I suppose. It, um, we'll, fi- we'll figure it out. It'll, it's got to be worth it, though, so get guessing. Let's move on to the match day six results in the Turkish Super League then. And uh, on Friday, we started off with Başakşehir Rizespor. Başakşehir getting an emphatic 5-0 win over Çaykur Rizespor. Goals here coming in the 19th minute through Daniel Alexic. In the 33rd minute by Frederik Gulbranson. Daniel Alexic got on the score sheet again in the 73rd minute. And in the 87th minute, Enzo Crivelli made it 4-0. And then finally, Irfan Jankavici with a long-range shot made it 5-0 in at a time. Uh, convincing win for Basak here, who started off slowly in the beginning of the season. But they seem to have finally gotten back on track here. Not really too much to add to this match. And as you will be noticing, we're changing up the format a little bit, people. Uh, we're going to talk less we, uh, we're going to have less people speak uh, on, on the matches we're just gonna go over them we've assigned 
each match to uh, to another person um, and th that person is going to take the lead on those matches um, I'll still be going over the scoreline and stuff like that but anyway for this game guys do you have anything to add it was really a convincing win for Bershakshi here they are they back out uh, are they out of their slump I should say they got a draw against Besiktas last week probably should have gotten the win there now very good win over Chaiko Rizespor quickly your thoughts guys do you think they are good to go or do they have the engine running now um, well, I think Rizzo Sport, they uh, had lost two games in a row, so they were kind of on a bit of a slump. I'm just surprised that Edin Visco only got one assist and no goals, despite the fact that that we had such a high scoreline. But I, I still don't think Poshek Schichter will finish in the, the top the top four, top five this season. Daniel Alexic having a, an impact, though, two goals here. and I, He impressed me, uh, I think, last week. He, it was um, his shot that got scuffed and ended up uh, in front of Enzo Crivelli's feet. It wasn't a great shot, but it uh, ended up in the right place. And then I think the week before that he scored, or, or, or was involved at least. So Alexic definitely picking up where he left out at Malatya before his very short stint in the sandbox. Now back in Turkey, quality player, of course. Uh, I think he is a great replacement for uh, Mossoro, uh, who was, of course, aging out. Are you a fan of uh, Alexei Cumut? Well, he's right now playing in a different position where he used to play for Malatya. Uh, yeah, he played more the, on the wing for Malatya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now he's playing more a central role and uh, having the like the general kind of position. Uh, dictating the game from the middle kind of position and I think he's working out well for him I yeah, fully agree uh, great player and I, uh, I think I don't know about the top 5 You know, I would have agreed with you Burak initially because I would have expected Besiktas to finish top 5 but as that uh, as that's currently standing I, I don't think they'll be making it so that opens up a spot uh, Alanya Spor of course looking great but, you know, Fenerbahce, Trabzonspor, Galatasaray seem logical choices. Then Alanya Spor doing well. But then there's a couple of teams, I think, vying for that fifth spot. I could see Bishakshir sneak in there. Maybe if Malatya Spor uh, have a good season again under Sergen. But they didn't have a great match today, but we'll get to that later. But let's move over to uh, Saturday with uh, Denizli Spor losing at home to Kasim Pasha, who now have back-to-back -back wins. This match ended 1-0 in favor of the visiting side, Kasim Pasha, who got their goal in the 67th minute through Haris Hay. Hayradinovic, Bosnian player, of course. Um, yeah, and a very good game. I felt uh, very up and down, uh, very back and forth. I should say both teams looked dangerous. Hugo Rodallega had a couple of really good opportunities, but uh, Fatih made some great saves. Um, and on the other end, uh, Kasim Pasha missed quite a few chances too. So again, Denizli Spor involved in a very spectacular match in uh, which this time around they come uh, out on the bottom and Kasim Pasha come out on top. Kasim Pasha looked a little bit dreadful early on in the season, but they've picked up now with six points in their last two games. So they're looking a lot better now. Um, yeah, I think two teams that will probably end in the belly of the league table. And, uh, an entertaining match at least uh, Burak did you uh, manage to catch any of this yeah I caught a few a bits and pieces of it just like like you said um, a little bit of a resurgence from Kazan Pasha a little bit of confidence from the win last week although um, Dennis the Spore were unlucky I think Yudo Rolega just didn't have a good day at the office and I think that's part of I think what stops him from going to be playing in in, in bigger teams and for on the bigger stages like he's just a little bit too inconsistent a little bit like Papi Sisse which we'll come to a little bit later um, but so he'll probably pop up next week and score knowing Hugo but like yep enter entertaining game hmm. um, full and neutral but also two guys in the twilight of their careers with Papi Sisse and, and Hugo Rodallega but still uh, performing 
quite well. I mean, he's getting into positions, like you said. Um, as you guys will be noticing, we're going through this a little quickly. Jakub was supposed to do Bashakshi here. Uzra was supposed to do this match, but they're both not here, of course, because of the rescheduling we had to do with Buag's birthday. Then Galt's Rice match in the Champions League on Tuesday. Spoiler alert, we're recording it after, but we'll be talking about that one next week. Uh, but the next match will, will involved Alanya Spore and Sivas Spore, and this one ended in 1-1. And uh, the goals here coming from Fernando Andrade in the first minute and Papis Sisse, who Burak just mentioned, in the 61st minute to tie it up. And Burak is going to tell us a little bit more about this match. Uh, yeah, so Alonso Sport League leaders, of course, going into this game and, and Sivas coming off a run of not that, you know, fantastic form um, that you see, but, you know... Um, you know, they're still quite high on the table, so it was all set to be a, a decent game of football, and that was served up to us after 35 seconds when Sivas went ahead uh, with uh, Fernando, um, a nice ball in from Chor, Chore, and a really good finish. And after that, he had a few like, incidents before the 1-1. Um, Alanya had a good shout for for a penalty when uh, a free kick came off the hand of a Sivas player in the wall. A little bit like the Ryan Babel instance we had earlier in the season that wasn't given. I feel that that could have maybe gone too far and Alanya could have felt a little bit hard done by there. Um, Jaehun hit the post. Um, Jaehun had a good game, had a couple of good shots on target all game, actually. So he was unlucky to hit the post in the second half. And you could see here, Alanya were really starting to put on the, the pressure. Samasa making a save for, for Siva Sport from a number of Alanya players. But the man in the, the highlight, Sisei, pops up after a Effigen cross to, to make it 1-1. But that is ruled off for offside, which was the correct decision, as the Effigen shot rebounded off the keeper. And I think it was Sisse who put it in for Alanya Sport. I may be mistaken, but the Alanya Sport player was in an offside position as Effigen shot, so that was the, the correct call to have that disallowed. But shortly after, Alanya's pressure paid off Effigen again, who was... Good all game actually. He got into good positions with some good crosses in. He got the cross in for Cisse, who probably one of the you know the harder goals he scored this season. A great header, putting it beyond Samasa after the sixty in the sixty first minute, um, and deservedly so after <clears throat> Alani had put on some really good pressure. But then you got Cisse again. We say he blows a little bit hot and cold. He misses a great chance just after from another effort on cross and. That's when we have the Jehun shot that is also saved by Samasa. And again, after that, Cissé misses yet another chance to make it 2-1. So, like I say, this guy's had about four shots on target and he's put one away. But if he just had his shooting boots on or it may, he was a little bit more clinical, then Alanya would have deservedly walked away with the points for this one. But then right at the end... Sivas had a goal disallowed after the Yatabade muscles past Wellington to slot the ball past the uh, keeper of Alanya Sport. Now, having seen his back of you, Marathona, that's the one. I thought it was Marathona with a T, but it is, it is an F. So, having watched this back, I think that it was a cop out by the ref. I think that Yatabade just mm -hmm. out muscled Wellington. Yeah. Um, it was a it's a one on one. You expect you know two players to be fighting for the ball to go a little bit shoulder to shoulder, but there was no clear push, no clear arm hooking, no clear foul play that I would consider, or that the EFA rules would mm -hmm. consider man of the law um, to be an, an offense. So I think Sivas can feel very hard done by to not have that goal. But it would have been unfair on Alanya if they'd got nothing out of this game because the fact they piled on so much pressure, missed so many clear chances. So, and did they, uh, did, did uh, the referee say... blow the whistle right after that as well? By the way, it wasn't I, because 
I, I don't remember. I think it was this match in which that kind of happened. Uh, like, because two weeks ago, that happened at, at halftime with the Bishkish match. Remember when the Rev just basically blew for halftime, which basically allowed VAR not to review the red card position for Douglas. And it kind of felt like it was the same here, where he just blew his whistle and the match was over. And rather than... Uh, because I, I think the, the, the players even went to him and started pointing towards the sideline, towards VAR. Um... Yeah, so it's just weird. Why are, why are referees doing this? Why aren't they allowing for a couple of s seconds at least to see if the, if far spotted anything? That's something I think. And, and we we also got the news that uh, Aslan Boa, who was the referee for that match two weeks ago, uh, Bashak Jirbishik, that was last week, I guess, uh, got his uh, license, uh, his, his referee license uh, retracted. So. Apparently, um, yeah, that's something that's being frowned upon. But I think that happened in this match as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, it was just very weird. I mean, you you should, even if it's the last kick of the game, you should still go to VAR if mm -hmm. there is a, a, a need for it. Yeah. And Sivas had a very good goal chalked off. But in the grand scheme of things, I'd, I'd probably say a, a draw is would is a fair result purely because of that Sivas goal having been ruled out. If that hadn't have happened, then I think Alonso Sporta would have felt that they'd dropped two points at home. And again, Sivas going to Alonso. The weather's getting a little bit cooler now as we get towards like the autumn, but still, you know, humid conditions in Alonso. It's not great to play football in. And I think it was a little bit earlier in the day as well, um, the kickoff. So I think Alonso Sporta would probably feel that they should have won the game. But unfortunately, Sisse um, wasn't as clinical as he could have been. Anything to uh, pick up on there, Umut? Any observations you had? Well, uh, about the Jay Hun's shot. I mean, uh, the first time I've seen Jay Hun back at uh, back in Trabzonspor, he had great shots and long shots. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really quality on that. And back in the time he played for us, uh, Galatasaray, he had that kind of. Uh, uh, talent on his pockets, but he didn't usually use that. I don't know why, but man is the one of the best shooters in the league, but he doesn't use it very often uh, unless he just it is necessary. Yeah, but I he doesn't know. get into the positions as often either. I think he's yeah, more like yeah. a breaker in midfield. So yeah, yeah, but it's a possible threat because uh, when he shoots, you see it's with massive power and. Uh, it's a real threat for the opposition keepers, and uh, I think he's just uh, using it effectively, but just rarely. Okay, well, let's move over to the main event of probably this match day, and especially of Saturday evening, that was Galatasaray against Fenerbahce, the first real big derby of the season, came early this season, match day six, usually that's... Uh, the, the match day where Besiktas and Fenerbahce meet up for the past three or four years straight. We had Besiktas Fenerbahce on match days five or six, I think. So, um, yeah, this time it's Galatasaray Fenerbahce. Match ended nil-nil. Not a huge surprise, I think. Um, but let's get your thoughts on it, guys. Uh, Umut, let's start with you since uh, Burak uh, had the floor before. Okay, first of all, I should say I traveled around like miles to get to the game from London to Istanbul you know and with great expectations and uh, great hopes uh, for Galatasaray but after watching the Galatasaray against Bruhe, Bruges uh, my expectations get lower and lower because we can't get into the positions and we can't meet Falcao with the ball inside the box uh, at any chance I don't know why but uh, with that 4-3-3 formation, uh, with Babel up front, uh, with Falcao, and our right wing all, all, always changes. It's uh, either Emre Mor, either Feguli, or many other choices. But the Babel and Falcao condition doesn't work really well, because he can't take the ball from either of the flanks. And this cost us, the cost us too much uh, by points or even in the Champions League. And Galatasaray started the game with a massive pressure on their shoulders even though they are playing at their home grounds but 
This is a thing about uh, Galatasaray Fenerbahce derby. Fenerbahce is always uh, coming without a pressure uh, or, or uh, a pressure uh, which is lower than Galatasaray's, of course, because they won a bunch of games in Galatasaray's home ground, but Galatasaray never won uh, in these is 20 or 30 years, Brack. Can you correct me? In 1999. Uh, I've yeah. lost count, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I do as well. But yeah, it's about the Galatasaray Fenerbahce derby. It's all about the pressure and the team who can handle it really well uh, usually gets the point. And in this game, Fenerbahce really started really well with uh, Vedat Muric up front and a different formation uh, what Arsene Yonal started this season. Uh, he started with a 4-4-2 uh, and Tolga and Ozan as his flanks. And with that philosophy, he managed really well to close the Galatasaray down. And Galatasaray couldn't handle the ball uh, in this first half, even though they had uh, great talents up front like Lemina and Belhanda as well, but couldn't handle the ball, couldn't manage to hold the ball or take it forward. And yeah, I think it was Lemina who was the most threatening of all, wasn't it? Yeah, Lemina uh, could take two or three shots on goal, but uh, they're all long shots and I think it was in trouble for a, a Altai kind of goalkeeper. And the thing is, uh, we hold the ball too much that our attacks became slower and slower and the opposition defenders are closing up at that time. Uh, I don't know why, but we can find a gap to create another chance and we just give the ball away uh, at any cost. Yeah, and we've noticed that over the past couple of weeks already that you guys yeah. seem to lack space on the wing. Uh, mainly, I think. Yeah, you, yeah. In the past, you had Bruma, you had Gary Rodriguez, you had Onyekuru. You're yeah. really missing that right now. You don't have that pace anymore. Yeah, Babel is the same kind of player, but he's old and didn't have, uh, don't have the pace anymore with him. Well, I think he's fast, but he's never really. A, he was never really a speedster, you know, like a Bruma, like a Rodriguez, yeah. like a Onyekuru, who are really, really fast. You know, to put it in FIFA terms. Bubbles probably like at 83, 84, which is good, you know? But these yeah. guys are like 90 plus. Yeah. <laughs> to put it in FIFA yeah. terms, because that's a big topic right now, of course. FIFA 20 is out. Umut spent the entire week trying to find it. Um, but yeah, so that, I think that's <laughs> how, you can, how you can probably view yeah. it. And with the, the system that Fatih Terum likes to play, I think you really do require someone like that. The only person in the squad that I can think of that has that type of speed is Emre Mor. But um, he's not starting. And yeah. Also, having to mention that Fatih Terim left the team alone uh, in their home grounds uh, for the last time uh, this season. I hope so. Uh, uh, but it's a thing, you know, uh, in the derby, it's a big game. And you shouldn't really left the team alone and the field. Uh, so it was Levant Hoja again uh, managing the team. And uh, I don't know who gives the orders uh, in that kind of thing. I know Levant Hoja doesn't have the, uh, you know, dominance to do that. They have like, instructions. They tell yeah, them, yeah. if, if yeah. it's still nil-nil in minute 60, put this guy on, take that guy off, whatever. Yeah, or they're uh, probably in communication through a telephone or whatever. There's, there's plenty of ways. It's always going to be Fatih Terim who's making the decisions. The only difference is that there might be a delay on the decisions. Yeah, I would say Fenerbahce was the dominating team in the second half until Denis Turish came in because I don't know why, but uh, taking Ozan uh, uh, on the right, right right back position and Denis Turish on up front on the right side uh, wasn't a good great idea because they it slowed Fenerbahce because uh, I think Denis Turish isn't as dynamic as Ozan Tufan right now. He's a uh, uh, you know, playmaker kind of player, not as dynamic box-to-box -box kind of player like Ozan. And so, Fenerbahce lost his uh, their dynamism uh, in the field and game balanced out. But until the position where Kulisa had the header uh, to the empty net, but 
the ball lost the space and Lewandowski just uh, saved it at the end. And game ended nil nil. Uh, didn't offer us too much. Uh, what a pity. Yeah, and Burak, uh, let's get your thoughts on uh, the match and mainly Fenerbahce's performance in it. Um, it was just quite boring and uneventful, which is what these derbies are kind of turning into. If you can forget the the two two last year when there was a massive like brawl on the pitch, and then the last time there was an actual winner in one of these games was you'd have to go back to April of two thousand and seventeen when Fenerbahce won. 1-0 against Galatasaray sorry, in the Turk Telecom Arena. But since then, it's just been draws. It's 0-0, 0-0, 2-2, 1-1, 0-0. And it's just, it, this procession seems to go on. In the last five times Fenerbahce have played at Galatasaray Stadium, there's been four draws and, and one win for Fenerbahce. So it, it appears that not only can Galatasaray not beat us in our own stadium they can't beat us in their own stadium as well um so i'm sure the absence of Fatih Tirum had an effect that's probably why there wasn't a big fight actually that thug wasn't <laughs> he wasn't patrolling the touchline with Hassan Shash that little parasite um but from a fair point of view um i was optimistic going to the game seeing um, Isla starting Hassan Al-Khazad on the bench yeah. thinking okay we're getting some defenders back into the team but Isla didn't have a very good first half and, and as I said after moving Ozan to right back I think purely because he's played that position now for four or five games so he's getting quite used to it so I think that's why Arsenal put Ozan there yeah, he started his career at right back and I think Shinel Gunish put him in midfield because before that in the Bursa youth uh, as far as I know he mm-hmm. always played right back Yep, I was not aware not aware of that. I've always only recognised him as a as a midfielder. So let's go see. He's got history and knowledge of that position. So I think he's our go emergency go to right back. We're seeing as we had uh, Dirar um, at left, and um, because Hassan Ali is injured, otherwise I think Dirar would have played the right back in his uh, absence. Um, I like to. I think Zanka had um, a very good game. He's often maligned by our fans, but. If you're looking at the the stats of the game, then he came up against Falcao one on one five times, won them all. He came up against Babel seven times, and he won six of those duels. Um, I think I saw a stat somewhere on a stat page which said he had um, an 81% success rate on one on ones. Um, he's a cool, calm head. He gets into the right position. Um, he looks quite slight in his build, but he is a little bit strong. He's almost quite sinewy, a little bit like Gustavo. Um, I think Gustavo, for me, he's been playing well. He's been an anchor there. He's Sometimes it seems as though he's very slow and he's almost trotting around, but then he'll just burst into life. Like one, um, a period of play where he just rushed after uh, Lamina and got the ball off him from behind. And I, I think Gatsby were forced to defend a lot. You know, they really struggled to try and contain Vedat Muric, who was using his body and ability very well. Um, I think both him and, and Falcao lacked service. Um, Falcao more than, than, than Vedat. Um, I think Vedat was just very well marked out of the game, whereas Falcao just didn't receive any service full I stop. I thought Vedat played an excellent game, actually. He made life yeah. miserable for uh, Galtrice defenders, I felt like. but Especially like Marcao. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Marcao, I think Marcao struggled, but still held his own. But you could see how much he was struggling with, with Vedat. Yeah, but, but you know, for Marcao, Vedat is a double-sized player, so mm-hmm. he's even taller than him and sometimes quicker than him and Marcao couldn't find a way to deal with it. Yeah, but if you look at, for example, okay, we're going to get a little bit into what, what happened this week, we're saving that for next week, but I felt like Marcao struggled more against Vedat than he did, for example, against Icardi the other day. You know, so that's that's kudos to, to, to Vedat, I think. I think Vedat played a really good game. I think, uh, Burak, you say, well, maybe Falcao was a little bit more service-starved, but I don't really know if I agree with that because I think your left wing... You know where uh, Dira was playing left back today uh, on this on this day. 
uh, instead of uh, Hassan Ali, for example. Um, and plus you had Gary Rodriguez fall out injured just before the match. I really felt like your left wing was basically paralyzed. Like you had nothing coming over that left wing. Max Cruz didn't have his day, so you didn't really have any uh, service from him. And then on the right, um, who was playing? We had who was well, no right? pace. We had the odds on started on the right wing in the first half and you had Tolga Giorgi on the left. So yeah. you've got... You have no pace yeah. or no width whatsoever in the first half. So, so you're trying to go through the centre and Vedat's doing his best, but there's no one to... Yeah, so I mean, he, he so... was fighting and I think he was winning most of the aerials. He was fighting for every ball, but he wasn't really getting a proper ball, though. I mean, so I, I, I don't think I fully agree with the fact that he was had better service than the Parkhavid. I think he just made more... Of, of what he got because he's more physical. Obviously, you know, Falcao's a relatively small guy compared to Veda, and Veda's very combative. That's just not what Falcao is going to do. So I think Veda had a. For me, Veda was uh, alongside. Well, Nzonzi was great. Uh, Veda was great. And then Ozan. I thought Ozan was really good too, uh, in general. <laughs> uh, well, quick, uh, quick yeah. question to you, both of you, because there's you, you did mention Gustavo there, yep. um, and uh, he had one scary position in the first half, I think it was, where it looked like he tackled um, Lemina, I want to say, um, and there was a VAR check, and they actually went to look, but then they ended up finding like a handball in the build-up from Ryan Babel, I believe, so there was no, they didn't even you know it didn't matter because yep. it was so it was thrown out but i want to ask both of your opinions on whether that was a penalty should there have not been a handball in the build-up uh brock you first man of the law man of the law for me n never a penalty um gustavo goes in he plants his back foot way beyond the leg of let's say it's lamina and then he's back foot just slides along the grass and what happens with the lamina is he just as he's running natural position leg comes back and he falls over so was there a little bit of contact with maybe uh, the, the front foot of gustavo yep there was maybe a little bit of contact but that doesn't warrant a penalty and i think Jeanette chuckered played his get out of jail card there <laughs> yeah. by by saying actually in the lead up to this there is a handball yeah. because if it had come down to the fact that there was no handball and he had to make a choice yeah. he uh, either set of fans would have crucified him if Galtasaray had been awarded a penalty and scored he would have been crucified if he hadn't awarded the penalty then Galtasaray fans would have been up in arms saying why haven't you given the penalty, etc. So, yeah. for me, no penalty. Jeanette Chuck would have probably breathed a sigh of relief <laughs> as he approached that VAR machine. I think so too. It's a very difficult situation a referee is being put in in a, in a game like this um, in front of the home crowd and then you get called in to check and then everyone's expecting, oh, he's going to point to the spot because, I mean, how can he not? You know, a full stadium screaming at you, you know, for the penalty. Uma, did you think it was a penalty? Well, you know, I was at the stand, so I didn't see the whole thing in a detailed manner. But, you know, uh, after I watched it uh, in a second time at home, uh, I didn't think it's a penalty. But as far as I know, VAR check is only for, uh, you know, by decision uh, yeah. after it. So the uh, check was for the penalty, but then yeah, they check found, was for the penalty. But, but then they found initially, the in initially, the initially, initially, Checker gave a corner there for Galatasaray, and they, and then he checked VAR and uh, changed it to a handball. But uh, if there is a VAR check, I don't think it's possible to change the no. uh, initial decision. No, they go back, and then there's the fall and the free kick for the handball. That's correct. Um, but uh, something pointed out to me by one of my friends is actually that Lemina actually kicked the floor, kicked the ground, and that's why he fell, uh, rather than contact with Gustavo. I don't know if uh, either of you noticed that, but I did notice that he did get a shot off. It went completely wayward. I don't think it got blocked. Did it get blocked? But uh, it, it did look like he just mishit it, and uh, I think he, I believe he like, I don't know. Uh, 
obviously, I think both of I you played some football he's... in your life. I once, I can, I can tell you once, I was, I was a winger, and uh, I was going in for, a, <laughs> I was going in for a cross, and literally, I was, I, it kicked straight into the floor, straight into the grass, and I flew up, like a ballerina or something. It was r ridiculous, just by yeah, kicking yeah. into the floor. So sometimes, you know, <laughs> when you kick, yeah, yeah, it's by feeling the contact, you have the like uh, thing to go and fall. I think it's a, mm. a primitive thing, you know. Uh, you cannot get out of that thing. Yeah. Anyway, I, I do agree with both of you. I don't think it was a penalty. I think it would have been really harsh. And let's be happy that uh, we didn't get a controversial penalty deciding this match. Then there was another big decision. That was the offside goal from uh, Radama Falcao. But I don't think much can be said. That was a clear offside position. So that's pretty yeah, much he, he Stonewall. Read it well, man. Yeah, he hit yeah. it. But just goes to show that if Carl can get service to Falcao, then he all he needs is one chance and one shot, and he can he can win you a game. Yeah, yeah. But definitely. I was also I was pretty disappointed by the atmosphere in the ground as well. It didn't seem very electric or fired up at all. Mm. So and near the goal. Uh, so go and come, watching it from the television, you know, the volume not up too much because I was ill of the weekend, you no know, horrendous headache. Oh, good but. But I'm, I'm I'm better now. Don't worry. But um, um what, what 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 did what was your because you were live in the stadium? How did being there compare to previous derbies that you've been to and previous matches? Did the atmosphere feel a little bit flat for you in the stadium? Because that's how it came across to the viewers. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, it was a, a letdown because uh, usually when the expectations are high, uh, they go they go to the stadium with a uh, you know. With a graded atmosphere and graded expectations, and uh, after the Bruges game, uh, the it was a letdown for Galatasaray and all the fans. And a little bit of a deflating effect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but do you think the there was more nervosity? I think I, I kind of felt like I, I mean I kind of jokingly said before the match when you were all in our group and we were all doing our, our predictions, I was like, ah, it's gonna be a nervous nil-nil draw. Both teams afraid to lose. And I, I kind of said it jokingly, it wasn't a serious prediction. Yeah. But, but that's kind of what it ended up being. You jinxed the damn match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all my fault, people. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, also, having said about the fans, uh, it was a great thing to see from the stands that away Fenerbahce fans opened up a poster uh, about their lost fan uh, like two years ago, Breck. You know better. Uh, yeah, it was last last year uh, at the the two two match. Yeah, uh, I I I remember that match. The, some of the fans, uh, majority of them, the majority of them, left the game before it is it's been finished, uh, and uh, went to the I think the ceremony mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, so, it was um, at right at the start of the first half. Um, yeah, uh, all right. of the fans left, and uh, the away fans then went like uh, all. Empty. It was a great thing to see uh, from great gesture from Fenerbahce fans to uh, uh, showing their respect to the fans who lost his, life, lost his life two years ago. And then at the end, there was the that famous picture of a little little girl, Galatasaray fan, posing with Mustafa Cengiz and Ali Koch taking a picture of them as uh -huh. well, which is a uh, nice nice That's to it. see. Um, and but no doubt the very next day they were both back to shit talking. So, <laughs> uh, one more thing, Umut. I know you've been advocating this, and actually, it's uh, sparked my interest a little bit. You say Fener uh, Galtzray should be playing four four two, and I can see a logic in that. F f previously, uh, Fatih Terim was very successful with a four four two. Uh, with Johan Elmander, I believe, and uh, yeah. who, was, who was the other striker, Baros at the time, I guess? No, not Baros. Yeah, yeah, we had uh, Baros Elmander, but mm. uh, at the uh, time we had two, two many strikers, uh, Nejati Kam. Mm. And you had Umut with, with Burak. Um, uh, no, Burak no, uh, with, that's with, the uh, next year. Next yeah, year. Umut, and then Burak with uh, with Drogba, that worked yeah. too. You too played a lot of four four two under Fatih Terim. And then the thing, this is what I want to get to. Uh, with the physicality, we, we were praising Vedat just before, uh, but Falcao never really was a physical striker. I mean, he's not a physical specimen. He's a guy that you need to 
Lee True, maybe? Do you think that mm. he would benefit from playing alongside, for example, your second striker, Andone, who is maybe yeah. a little bit more physical? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because Andone is eager to play as well. And mm -hmm. he's more like a, uh, you know, Warrior? he wants to win the ball up the field. So, uh, stamina yeah. kind of player. And he never gets tired. And mm -hmm. you, you can expect more from him. And it will be a great choice to put him alongside Falcao. Yeah. Do you think Fatih Terum will try it out? I don't know. He's more uh, kind of uh, arrogant and insistent on his choices. And I don't know. Uh, if he's going to change it, we'll see. But uh, he did uh, he did change a, a thing, a, a formation in this uh, Champions League game against Paris Saint-Germain. He went for a 3-5-2, uh, which is a different thing. Yeah. Right now, uh, it yeah, we'll like expect. Uh, it was more like a seven, a seven one or seven two yeah, one yeah. or something. It was very <laughs> defensive. Yeah. And, like, yeah. Um, and then right at the end, Mad Max. Yeah. That's a header as Muslera rushes out and yeah. Kung Fu kicks him, and there, there a little, a little bit, of, a little bit of I contact. There's a very little bit of contact, and other players may have tried to make an absolute meal of that and go down and try and win a penalty, even though it was kind of right on the line of the penalty area. So it would have had to have gone to VAR, but kudos to, to Mad Max. He just got his head on it and there was just no pace or power on it. And I think Lewin Dharma just cleared it up with relative ease. Yeah. But for so, me, Fenerbahce, it did look like the more... Uh, eager side the last 20 minutes uh, I, I know Burak um, sorry uh, Umut said that uh, it kind of went down one when Ozan, Ozan uh, when Denis came on for Ozan but I mean it was a free kick that was in a very good position and then there was of course that, that opportunity for, for Max Cruz uh, and there were a couple of other moments and I just didn't have the sense of Galtra in the final 20 minutes that they were really going for the win I, I just yeah. felt like they had settled for a draw at that point and Fenerbahce looked like the more likely team that maybe wanted to try a little bit more take a little bit more risk and I was kind of surprised by that because this was kind of a must-win match for Galtra obviously it's early in the season but they kind of missed their start Fenerbahce had a decent start even though they're not that far apart in terms of points but I yeah, yeah. I, was, I was surprised by that. We still only got one defender playing in its correct position, and that's Zanka, a centre back, um, which is just just baffles me. Um, I think that's just a sign of a poor transfer policy, but or limitations through financial fair play, you know? I mean, exactly, um, and just bad luck that those people got injured at that particular time. But mm -hmm. Isla's coming back, Hassan is coming back. Rami is clearly not ready, as we saw against uh, Kota Guja last mm -hmm. week. Yeah. Um, so for I think the, for the speed, yeah, for the sphere, foreseeable future, it's looking like it's uh, Jalson alongside uh, Zanka, um, maybe with the odd uh, cameo from Luis Gustavo to play as uh, centre back and even an emergency left back if Hassan Allah re injures himself. But you know, we'll, we'll look to see who's fit to to play this weekend, but. Um, all things said, pretty uneventful derby, um, considering the last two we've had, where we actually had some goals and mm -hmm. some and some some red cards and fights. It was pretty much all kisses and cuddles at the end of the match. Yeah, maybe uh, the absence of faulty term did have an effect, but maybe not a poor one. Uh, maybe not a bad one for sportsmanship. Anyway, if either of you have had your say, then let's move on to Sunday. Can I say one thing, one last thing? No. No, oh. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, at the time where Fenerbahce had the, their free kick, uh, uh -huh. which is close to goal, they had three set-piece specialists alongside the ball, and who are Emre Belazolo, uh, Denis Turic, and Max Kruse. Uh, and uh, Emre did take it because I think he's uh, pretty dominant on their cho uh, team choices, and... Uh, about the, you know, influence on the ball. Uh, no, I think it all just depends who is best for, you know. Is best yeah, for uh, I'm pretty much uh, happy about because it, I think if Dennis Trush took it, he would hit the back of the net at the time uh, because he's 
really on form with the set pieces right now. I and, don't know, man. I mean, and, scoring against Moldavo is one thing. Scoring in a derby in Turk Telecom Arena against Galatasaray is another thing. Pressure is a really big factor in these sorts also, of things. Also, comparing this with Galatasaray, when we are having a free kick in that same kind of area, we have nobody to mm -hmm. take it. Yeah, it's no, the Siri was problem. taking all the set pieces the other day against PSG. Uh, yeah, I guess Fatih Terra a... was fed up with Belhanda's uh, corners yeah. and free kicks. Yeah, yeah, but uh, as well, Belhanda, uh, nor Belhanda or Seri are set piece specialists. We were mm. in a need of it, and yeah. we don't have anybody to take these. They're both guys that can take a corner, can take a free kick, kind of like Ozan at Besiktas, like they can do it. Yeah. But they're not specialists. Uh, Media curse. Yeah, indeed. Like it's better than Zanka taking him, for example. Probably, I don't know. Maybe Zanka has a great uh, technique on the ball, uh, kick kicking technique. But uh, you know what I mean. Like it's better than your average yeah. guy doing it. But yeah, yeah. We have seen with Belhanda, for example, that he struggles to just get the the ball uh, over the the first man. At the, so. Even on free kicks, on corners, on everything. So Galts are definitely missing their 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 set piece specialist. Selchuk Inan in the past, of course, for the last years was very good in that. Of course, we had was amazing. Schneider. We had was the Schneider who had great set pieces too. So they've yeah, it's it's just so important in the modern game. Even uh, Burak for Besiktas right now doing his best for free kicks, but right now we don't have anybody. Yeah, it's just so you know corners and, and and free kicks. Score if you score easily from the from set pieces. That's just that makes your life so much easier as a team because especially in a league like Turkey where there's so many stubborn teams that are going to make life difficult for you. They're going to have ten people behind the ball or nine people behind the ball. They're going to make the, the spaces small and you're. Or either going to, like Galtry right now, going to have to rely on, on, on a pacey winger like on Yakuru, Gary, or, or Bruma, whatever, or on good set pieces. If Galtry would have good set pieces right now, then th there wouldn't be a problem because as soon as you get that first goal, spaces open up, you get more room to attack, and that's when, you know, that's what Besiktas are struggling with too right now. You just have such a problem finding that goal. And uh, Galtry, you know, to a lesser extent, had that same issue. And I think that's what Fenerbahce are not struggling with. They, 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 like Burak pointed out, yes, they have their defensive woes, but the best form of defense is offense. And I think, you know, Ersun Yano, of course, epitomizes that uh, mentality, perhaps. Um, it's a little bit uh, ridiculous uh, to an ex uh, well, um, highlighted to an ex a ridiculous extent right now with their uh, defensive situation, but they have a lot of more weapons up front. Okay, okay, Gary wasn't here, and we noticed his absence. Even though I don't think we really rate him, but his pace makes a difference. But just having that one man army up top, Vedat Muric, who I think right now is the best striker in the league. Um, yeah, it just makes such a world of a difference. Um, but yeah, let's let's move on, guys. Uh, we've gushed enough about Vedat. I have gushed enough about Vedat. <laughs> you could, I think, people can uh, guess uh, who I would pick if I could pick one player from our, our rival teams to uh, add to uh, to add to uh, my my squad. I don't know who you guys would pick, but I, I know who I'd pick. I'll think about that one. I'll let you know at the end. <laughs> Not a Besiktas player, I'm pretty sure. Uh, let's move over to Sunday then. Konya Sport against Kayseri Sport. The struggling Kayseri Sport, I should say. Konya Sport here winning this match 2-1. Goals here coming from Levin Shengalia scoring an own goal in the ninth minute, putting Kayseri Sport in front. But Dini Milosevic equalized at the stroke of half time to make it 1-1. Then Marko Jevtovic converted a spot kick in the 90th minute to make it 2-1 for Konya Sport. Both Bernard Mensa and Pedro Henrique saw a red card following uh, the penalty as well. Pedro, um, Bernard Mensa with a little bit of a kicking motion, I think, got sent off. And then Pedro Henrique in the tumultuous uh, yeah, uh, result of that uh, red card, he got sent off too. And I think that <laughs> that's not the first time it happens to him. It's it like a second or third red card already this season. He got one against Galatasaray for kind of complaining too. And I'm not sure, but I think he might have gotten one on match day one as well. Um, so, yeah, I think it's his third red card already for Pedro Henrique. 
always very threatening for Kaiser Sport, but the guy is getting a lot of cards. Uh, Buak, you covered this match for us. Let's hear what you got to say. I will say the the main action points happened at the the start of the halves. So as you know, uh, after nine minutes, some um, really bad own goal by uh, Shingalia of Konya. But to be fair to the guy, he really tried to make it up after. He pressed forward up the, the pitch in the Kaiser Sport half. He tried to get some crosses in. He really tried to... You could see that he was trying to make up for his errors, which, is, which was good to see. And then it was a really well-worked goal, goal by Konya to equalise on the stroke of half-time. I think it was in, in the first or second added minute of stoppage time. Just a nice little triangle play and a really nice tidy finish by Milosevic into, into the box. Um, Faruk Mia was quite quiet. Um, we uh, raved about him a little bit, you know, the young, powerful player. He had a really good shot, um, I think, midway into the second half. That just went over the bar. That would have been like a hell of a goal to make it 2-1 if that had gone in. And then I think it was the 90th minute in, uh, into the 8th minute of added time that the penalty was given to, to Konya Sport. And it was a VAR check that actually brought the, the decision in. And having looked at it, having started at EFAB rules and being, of course, mm-hmm. a man of, man of the law. Um, the hand was extended above shoulder height, making his body bigger. And I think that's something he had to give the, the penalty for. So it's a... But I think it was only after Skubic was literally screaming in the face of the referee. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if he got booked for that or not. No, I, I would have booked, don't think would he have, did. Would have booked him. He was just like a hellacious, just like screaming... But it seemed to do the job as it went to VAR and the, it was given. And then we had the madness at the end with, with Mensa just losing his cool and probably due to the fact that he's, he's seen his team gone down. Um, he's lost his cool. He's lashed out. He's got, I think it was a, a second yellow to make it a red. Enrique starts yapping. He gets mm-hmm. sent off. And then uh, a member of the Kaiser Sport uh, bench <laughs> was sent off as yeah. well. Um, so I'm not sure it was Johnson I'm not sure Johnson goaded Mensa into getting that second yellow but it was end of the game and the, I think Mensa had gone in quite hard on Johnson he just he was just given a little bit back um, Mensa bit and he got his just desserts exactly um, and that is, that's my you know, nothing that much happened in this game. I want to say um, the main talking points happened at the start of the half, start and at the end of the halves with the goals, the free kicks, penalties, the sendings offs. Um, one kind of Faruk Mir shot that flew over, and there was there's a nice clip online about um, I could waiting for the Cornersboro players and hugging them all and kissing their kids as they come out, which is. I know, it's just a nice heartwarming moment in the current shitstorm that is Turkish football. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that that's pretty much sums up the game. It was all action at the start and end of the halves and not much filler in between. Yeah, not a very active Serkan Kerintele this week. Uh, didn't have to make that many saves. Um, yeah, Kayseri struggling. They're, I don't know, I... I have not it's kind of like the same to, even more so than with games terribly i just feel like high Street sport do have a decent side and do play decent football and right now just seem to i don't know just get shortchanged maybe um i think a point here would have been fair um and they've had matches like that before this season already where they probably got a little bit less than they should have and right now they're dangling down at the bottom of the table just I think one point above of Genshin Terribly, if I'm not mistaken, at three. Um, so that's yeah. right. Winless in the last six, along with Genshin Lash. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Umut, anything to add, or shall we move on to the next one? We should move on. Okay, the next one is Antalya Spor Malatya Spor. This match ended three nil to Antalya Spor. Goals here coming from Atif Sheshu in the 38th minute and Ufuk Akyol in the 61st minute before we saw a red card to Mustafa Akbash 
I think that was already an added time, really, after the VAR check and everything. I think the initial yeah, yeah. yellow card was in the 85th minute, but that got overturned and got changed into a red card. And then from the resulting free kick, Hakan Uzmert scored a beauty, an absolute beauty. Um, you know, I think last season, Hakan Uzmert, I've known him for so long as a footballer. And I've always seen him as kind of a boring central defensive midfielder. Like years, literally years. The guy must be close to 30 years old. And, and for years, you just saw him as, a, as an average, you know, boring central defensive midfielder. And then suddenly last season, he started scoring all these stunning goals for Antalya Spor. And free kicks. This isn't the first free kick he scored. And I just can't remember him ever doing that before. I, I prob I'm probably just, you know, I probably just overlooked it in the past. But, wow, what a free kick. Anyway, Umut, you covered this game for us. Let us hear yeah. what you've got to say. Well, uh, before the uh, uh, Art of Shesha's goal, Sergei Yeltsin's Mayotte Spur really balanced that game and even missed some uh, open chances with Morike Fofana up front, uh, missing from six-yard box. Uh, I don't know how he missed that, but... After Artur Shesha's goal, uh, Malatyaspor panicked a little bit and uh, pushed up uh, searching for a goal, uh, but their defensive work went real bad and almost non-existent at all. And after that, Antalyaspor found countless chances in front of the goal and youngster Ufuk scored from a defensive error, uh, a long shot but not very far. He even lost his balance before shooting, but there were no Malatya defenders covering him and he scored really easily uh, in front of the Malatya sport defense. And uh, in the last minute, uh, a red card was given, as you said before, to Mustafa Akbash. Uh, initially, it was a yellow card. Uh, and uh, even Mustafa Akbash was uh, objecting to the ref, but after the war check, uh, it's been, uh, I think it's been uh, committed as a last uh, man uh, defender thing, you know. Oh, okay. I was kind of curious what what, uh, what the red was for. Yeah. Because, yeah I mean, the, he, like you said, he was protesting. He was, I mean, he was not protesting, but he was like kind of surprised that he even got a yellow. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it was, uh, I think it was uh, committed as a last man foul uh, and giving a direct red card to him and from that uh, certain free kick Hakan Ozmer bent it really well to the back of the net even mm -hmm. it's a uh, you know uh, it was a fine spot for a left footer but he's a right foot footed player and put it directly to the far post and... it, it reminded me of do you remember Burak Sergen's uh, goal against Fenerbahce in Kadikoy in 2004 when Recep was in goal Ugh. it reminded me of that one but then yeah. a lot harder yeah. like a lot of power on this one like Sergen just kind of brushed it in but this was like yeah it was what great a, what a even, strike even a tall keeper like Farno cannot do anything yeah. about it but he even took a step to the other side before Jassi take it because he yeah, predicted about uh, he's going for the mm -hmm. over the wall, but he didn't. And the game ended 3 0 for Antalya. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, was a fair reflection of the match, or do you feel like Malatya maybe, uh, I mean, like you said, Malatya early on looked good, probably should have gotten on the score sheet? I did see some people on Twitter going, oh, you've kind of <laughs> talking a little bit of smack about Sergen and, yeah, you know, and the team yeah, you know, not it's... being able to defend. But if you look at the qual, I, I, I mean, I've said this during the during the European qualifiers, during the Europa League qualifiers, their back line is very poor in terms of quality. I really Yeah, like... he, he, you know, Robin Yelchin used to play a central defensive midfielder for yeah, Chai Kulize. Yeah. yeah, but he uses it as a central uh, defensive, central defense, you know. Yeah, it's probably for build-up. Yeah, Mina. build up. Uh, you know, you get punished for that because what uh, Abdullah did back in uh, uh, Başakşehir, like uh, putting Mahmoud? Mahmoud Tekdemir there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, he he doesn't have the uh, physical Physicality. battle. Yeah, 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 physical thing uh, to mm -hmm. battle for the ball. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. 
yeah. uh, Robin Yelchin. Just... Uh, we're talking about not Mahmoud here, of course. But yeah. I, I generally don't really like their back line. Chabek is a player I really don't like. Yeah, um, in he's terms of... their captain. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I really don't rate him. And then Erkan Kash, of course, Besiktas youngster. I like him, but he's not very good. He's similar. Um, he's really similar to Janer wise because he's good yeah. at attacking face, but poor man's Janer. Yeah, his his defensive uh, manners are yeah. not full, cool, man. And yeah. And then there's Mina. Mina, I really like. I really rate. I think he's one of the best mm -hmm. central defenders in the league. But he's literally the only good defender in that back line. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not. I'm actually surprised that Malatya Sport have done as well as they have so far this season. I really expected them to struggle a lot more simply because of their really uh, vulnerable back line. And, I, I, yeah. And you know, Sargan is. Uh, he's likes. He likes attacking play and all. Mm -hmm. And after conceding the goal, he just uh, wants to wanted to influence the game uh, and no. balance the game out. But it's just gone vice versa. And Antalya Sport found countless of chances in front of the goal, and eventually they found the goal with that mm -hmm. youngster Ufuk scored a really good good goal, and it ended three 0 No. Book okay, anything to add, or shall we move on? No, I think you guys have covered it all. Okay, well, okay, people, uh, because we're late this week, as you know, I did pre-record a couple of segments, one of which is the next one, Ankeregeju against Kinsterbly. Um I pre-recorded that, I spoke to Nadim uh, about this match, and, uh, well, have a listen. And moving on, we have the first Ankara derby since 2012 between Ankara Gujur and Genshterberli. The last time these two teams met in an official capacity was in January 2012. Genshterberli won that match, but on this day it wouldn't be so, as Ankara Gujur ended up winning 2-1 against their rivals Genshterberli. The scoring went as follows, Daniel Kamdea scoring an own goal in the 56th minute, that was basically forced by Michael Pazdan. And then in the 68th minute, Ilham Parlak doubled Ankaragujus' advantage. And then finally in the 75th minute, Korjan Celikai, the goalkeeper, scored an own goal uh, following a long shot from Zargo Toure that took a deflection on Kulusic and then <laughs> took a deflection on the back of uh, Korjan Celikai. Um, kind of everything that could go wrong went wrong there and uh, pay attention because that's going to be a team later on in the podcast with another team. Um, but joining me right now is Nadim Raja of the Round Ball in Ankara. He's of course an Ankara Gaju fan. He previews all of Ankara Gaju's matches, reviews the matches and uh, yeah, just a huge Ankara Gaju fan. Great person to follow on Twitter if you are interested in Ankara Gaju. Nadim, thank you very much for joining us on the show once again. Thanks for very much for having me on, Ken. It's nice to be on. Um, how's life in Belgium? Oh, in Belgium it's all good. In, Ang in Istanbul it's a little less uh, good, I would imagine, with my fellow Besiktas fans. But yeah, we're having you on because this is a special occasion. The first Ankara derby between Ankara Gijou and Genshterbeli since 2012. Obviously there's been other Ankara derbies with Osman Le Sport involved, but that's not really the real thing. It's kind of like uh, a cheap Chinese knockoff of the actual derby, Ankara Gijou against Terbili. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm sure you're over the moon with the result. But what did you think of Ankara Gijou's performance? Did you think against Terbili deserved to lose on the day? Um, who were the better team overall? And, and what was your general thoughts on the match? I think to actually go over the match, we need to also look at the, the lead up to the match as well to kind of put things into perspective. Um, obviously, everybody knows that Ankara Gucci have got a transfer ban, um, but as the weeks go, go by, it's getting more difficult. Um, during the week, we lost uh, Tito Canteros. He was injured in training, and he's arguably our, our best player. Um, he's actually in the top seven players in the uh, midfielders in the Super League in key passes. So losing him was a big blow. And then Moke, um, he got injured in training, so it, it was unclear whether he was going to start the match. And um, Chebrail broke his, his foot last week as well. So then the kind of number really struggling to even fill the bench at the moment. So there was an opportunity for Hassan Kaya um, to come in. And this he's come through a youth academy in Strangely enough, it was his first start in four years for Ankara Um 
he's 23 years old, so he's not really considered a young player anymore. But it was an opportunity for him. Um, I think that if we look at the first half, Gensler really dominated, and I think Rigucci were lucky to go in at half time level. Um, Gensler had three or four chances in the first half. First of all, Sesang Young had a shot which was brilliantly blocked by Kitsu. Um, he, he blocked the shot and it went over the crossbar. Um, Michael Pazdan cleared a, an opportunity off the line from, from Giovanni Sio. Um, and then they had another couple of chances where Korchan made a couple of good saves as well. But midway through the first half, and things starting to kind of go wrong again for us when our manager met him, the Adin was, was sent off. Um, he was unhappy with a challenge on Thiago Pinto and he must have said something to the referee. I don't know what he said, but the referee sent him off. Um, and then from there on, kind of getting in at half time, you're thinking if we can come away with even a point from this game, we'll be happy. Um, but then we came out in the second half and and the game really changed. There was a kind of 15, 20 minute spell where Andrew Gucci started to dominate the game. And it was great to see Hassan Kaya um, come up with an assist for the first goal. It was his corner that was put into the box. And Ricardo Fati headed the ball on. Ilhan and Pajdan both tried to get the ball over the line, um, but the, their goalkeeper made a good save. And then Daniel Candias tried to clear the ball and, and, and ended up putting it into the back of his net, which is quite good for me to see because he, he's an ex-Rangers player. So uh, an ex-Rangers player helped Nan Kragucci, I'll, I'll take that any day. And then we shortly after, we made it 2-0. And again, Hassan Kaya was involved again when he played a brilliant through pass for Kitsio. He played the ball across for Dever Ordio. And his shot was saved by the goalkeeper um, and Ilhan was in hand to put the ball into the back of the net. There was a quick check with VAR um, to see if it was offside, but they checked and, and the referee gave the goal. So 2-0 up. But you, it, even at that stage, you're still thinking Gensler Bailey played well in the first half. They've still got some good players in the team. I, I probably still would have set up for a draw at that point as well. And then when Zargo Ture <clears throat> he had a shot from just out of the box, which was deflected off a Kulisic, hit the post, come back off a Korchan, and then ended up in the back of the net. And at that point, you're thinking, of oh, he here we go. Um, Orgil and, and Mehmet Sack both had opportunities for Ankara in the, the kind of dying stages of the game to, to, to make it 3 1. Um, but again, the Gensler Bela goalkeeper, um, I think it's Ertach, his name, made a couple of good saves. And, and in the end, we managed to, to to hang on for the three points. So overall, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted um, with the, the result. Also delighted with the second half performance. And I think the fact that Andrew Gucci have even get like more than a point at this stage, never mind eight points, is a miracle because we have such a poor poor side. And that's no disrespect to any of the players. Um, Apart from the defence, I think we've got a really good back four um, and Korchan's a pretty decent goalkeeper. And then you've got Kanteros in midfield and Orgeal up front. That That's basically it. The rest is filled with guys like Sedat and, and Ilhan who are, shouldn't really be playing in the Super League. Sedat's 38. And then you've got guys like Hassan Kaya. It's great to see him getting an opportunity, but at 23, he's been playing in the lower leagues of Turkey for the last three or four years. Um, so, yeah, delighted with the result. Um, I'll come on to another thing in a wee second once you come back in, but I think there was a wee bit of a missed opportunity with Ankara Derby, but I'll speak to you about that in, in, in a few seconds after kind of hearing your opinion on the game. Yeah, I think you summed it up really nicely. I'm against Chevrolet, definitely... Uh looked to dominate the first half and uh, they had opportunities to score but I think I've said it a couple of times over the past couple of weeks they don't look like a poor side at all I think they it's a little weird to see them at just two points at the bottom of the table right now same thing can be said about Kayseri Sport I'd say who will only have three points out of six games and both of these teams are bottom at, at the, of the table at the moment but they haven't looked that bad overall but against Terribly 
yeah, couldn't get the job done in the first half, then concede on, on, on the first real sign of threat, I think, from a corner in the second half. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of Besiktas in the way that they're, it's all good up until that first goal goes in. And, and, and as soon as that happens, it's kind of sink or swim. And uh, usually it's a uh, sink, <laughs> and it's kind of the same position they terribly seem to be in right now, despite the fact, which we, like you have pointed out, they don't have the worst players. And then you have Ankaragücü on the other end of the spectrum, with a very limited team, not a lot of squad depth, but they're making the most of it right now. They're gathering good points, um, and, and frankly, they haven't looked so bad this season at all. I think they had spells last season where they looked a lot more dead in the water. Whereas now, yes, maybe they don't have the quality, but they definitely have the team spirit and they're going for it and, and they're not just laying down and taking it. Um, yeah, and I think they, as they continue to perform like this and if they manage to lift the transfer ban in, ban in January, I think they should be able to stay up, but um, it's very difficult to see to, to pr predict right now how it's gonna go. If you look at the bottom of the table, uh, frankly, uh, maybe I'm a little partial, but I think Besiktas have played by far the worst overall in in, in the season that uh, from all the teams that I've watched that are dangling down below there at the moment. So um, I think Ankaragücü get a really good win here. This was maybe one of their worst first halves of the season, but they get through it and, and they weathered the storm and they got the three points, which is the most important thing. So what's that point you wanted to make about um, the, the build-up? So the build this the, this was the first ever time that the Ankara Derby was um, broadcast outside the Turkey. So there was 70 countries that, that showed the game, um, including France, Croatia, and then the rest of the countries were in were in, were in Africa, and obviously, if this was maybe like two seasons ago, um, I think it would have been a great opportunity. We seen Angrigutu with a full stadium, even like minimum fourteen, fifteen thousand. <clears throat> but because of the issues that are going on off the field at the moment, there's a large protest against Meme Ina. So a big kind of proportion of the fans are uh, basically boycotting which is the, the Ankara Gujar president to be clear for our yeah. listeners so I think when people are from other countries that have never seen this game that are tuning in and that have seen large sections of the stadium that are empty although the atmosphere was still pretty good we had um, there was a group of um, fans from Thailand who were at the game and they've put up some posts on the on the, on Twitter um, basically saying how good the atmosphere and things like that were but there only was about five six thousand people at the game and that's made up of mainly Gechikonda the rest of the support have, have boycotted because there's they don't trust Yine um, and it's well, Anchor Gucci fans will, will go and watch the club even if they're bottom of the league they don't really care about trophies well they do care about trophies but they don't go and follow the club just to see them winning trophies because we've never won trophies in our history. But the it's it's the corruption and the lies and Mehmet Yini have been unable to actually tell the fans where the money's going. There's no communication and that they're, they're angry at that and they're they're saying, Well, we're not spending our money going to watch the games until you've left because they tell so many lies. And it's just disappointing that the first ever game that's broadcast outside the Ankara would then have like even three quarters of the stadium full because I think that would have been great for people to see and instead that's the product that we've got. But as we all know that people that watch Turkish football in general, there is so many missed opportunities with things like this, um, with too many empty stadiums for different reasons. Um, and it's something that they're going to need to look at the top of the game because there's a great product there. But again, touching on what you said earlier on, if you look at the Turkish table there now, it's great that there's a comp there's competitiveness there. But at the same time, there's a there's a real lack of quality this season. There's not a single team there that you would look at and say that's a really good team. They really stand out and th they'll do well in Europe. It, they seem to be regressed, and I know that a lot of that's because of the economy and finances, that type of thing. I think this is the season where Trabzonspor would would have had a really good chance of winning the league had they not had so many kind of injuries at this stage as well. Um, 
but yeah, looking definitely. at the top, there's so many teams at that top ten of the table that you think pff, anybody could win it this season. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at Galtzrite's squad, they 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 look stacked, but then the football they're playing isn't all that just yet. It can still yeah. change, of course. Fenerbahce, I think, are playing decent football, but they aren't. I think right now they're they're looking like probably the most likely title contenders alongside Trabzonspor, but then Trabzon have those injury issues, like you pointed out, which you know that's gonna cost them points at some point of course anyway Nadim I want to thank you very much for coming on and shedding your light on the Ankara Derby uh, people please head over to www.ankarafootball.blogspot.com and go and check out the round ball in Ankara and uh, we'll be moving on now with our next match and that next match is Trabzonspor Besiktas this one ended in an emphatic 4-1 win to the hosts Trabzonspor trashing Besiktas at home and with that Besiktas are now among the bottom three in the league uh, they're in good company with Kayseri Sport and Genshi Terrible down there Besiktas still on five points after six games Trabzon Sport despite the injury woes continue to have a good result they, 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 they rebound here from an unfortunate defeat last week at the hands of Sivaspor, but with what but what a way to rebound this is with a with a big win over Besiktas. The scoring here went as follows: in the 31st minute, Dorokan Tokus scored, scored an own goal to put Trabzonspor 1-0 up. In the 42nd minute, Jose Sosa doubled the scoreline following a pretty big deflection from Nejib Uysal on a long shot from Sosa. Then in the 65th minute, Alexander Sorlot made it 3-0, adding insult to injury. In the 79th minute, Besiktas got on the score sheet through the substitute Guven Yalcin making a 3-1. But then in the 88th minute, Antoni Wakaeme put the cherry on top of the cake for Trabzonspor, making it 4-1 to Trabzonspor. A really big win. Um, but does it tell the entire story of the, of, of the match? We'll uh, delve into that right now, Jakub. First, I'm going to let you have your say. What was your general feeling about the match? I, I know you rushed home. You didn't manage to catch it all, I think. Uh, but from what you saw, what did you think of Trabzon Sports' performance? What did you think of Besiktas' performance? And what did you think about the overall result? Was it an accurate reflection of the match? Or was it an exaggerated scoreline? Could it have been even worse? Your thoughts, please. Um, yeah, I, uh, I didn't catch the whole game. I missed the first 15 minutes. I was at work, so I was like running to catch the match. Um, I watched the game with a with a friend of mine that is uh, that is Besiktasla, so it was a fun game to see him squirm. Um, ah, you bastard! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, I I I quickly looked at the highlights again, and I I, I missed I apparently missed a uh, shot of uh, Wakayama that hit the post. But um, yeah, we talked. I talked with you. Um, up and stuff and uh, you don't really agree with me uh, um, I know that um, Trabzonspor I, I do think that Trabzonspor played a really good game I have to give props to the team you know um, they, they rebounded really good as you said uh, from the from this result in the Europa League um, I like that the team really had some you know some chemistry again it seems like everyone seems to um, have their uh, have their performance uh, up a notch a little bit um, I really, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of Sosa. He's, the, he's my favorite player on the team, and today he, um, sorry, yesterday he once again showed that, you know, he is the person that is supposed to lead this team. Uh, with the absence of Yusuf Yazidji, he's pretty much the only guy that is, you know, trying to go to the attack. And even though even though the both goals were, you know, deflections, first uh, first with Dorokan uh, heading the ball over, and uh, the second with Nijip getting hit. Um, he was pretty dangerous the whole game. You know, he was always trying to attack. He, he's, he's an old guy, but he's he's really he has really good stamina. He keeps running the whole game, um, and he was really dangerous. You know, um, but otherwise, I think pretty much the whole team played good. I don't really uh, I didn't really have one player that I thought of that uh, had a bad game. Um, before the game, I, I I looked at the lineups and I saw that you know Karaman was going to play Kamil. Kamil Ahmed Cherek as a right half, and I didn't know if that would work because uh, Kamil has been had been injured for a long time. And um, I, even though I like him, he has some really spotty performance even when he's uh, when he's healthy. But he was he was really dangerous on the right wing, you know. But um, he's pretty pacey as a player, and um, he made it quite hard for the Besiktas defense to you know catch up to him. 
and he was always looking for the attacking run. I think it was mainly um, a smart move to put him there to lock down Nkudu. I think that was the main idea. First neutralize him and then go forward and join the attack. And following the 2 0, got so much space. Because before that, I, I, didn't, I really didn't see Kamil in the first 40 minutes or so of the game, eh? honestly. I think he. Yeah, I think. I think it was, you know, just just as you said, to cut the pace that Enkudo has. Enkudo has Enkudo is really, really, really fast, you know. And normally we would have, you know, pacey players like Yusufo or Abdul Kadir, you know, switch on the wings, you know, to take him up. But um, it was a good move. I was, I was, I was a little bit in doubt before the game started that it would, you know, it wouldn't really work. But um, yeah, my best, my best special friend said that he pretty much played the game of his, you know, game of his life. It was pretty good. Um, but uh, I really liked, uh, I really liked Sirlot. Um We had some little back and forth with you about him and Wadiega being pretty much the same player. But he yesterday again showed that for a guy that's like 191, he's really fast. He's really nimble. Um, it's, it's unbelievable that a guy that, that with his with his height, you know, can can do these runs. You have the, the third goal by uh, the third goal, um, no, the fourth goal by Waka um, He runs the whole pitch and he doesn't really slack off behind Waka after, after having played like 85 minutes of game, you know. And we miss, we we, we know that, um, you know, Karaman likes to keep his players fit, you know, and it's, it's, it's really good to see that um, that even after playing like 80 plus minutes, the players are really fresh, even after having played a week, a game, uh, you know, in the midweek against uh, um, in the in the Europa League. So um, it was in, in all in all, it was a pretty good match for me. Um, I do think that the score doesn't really indicate um, how the game went. It's uh, the first two goals, as I said, deflections that could have get, could have went either way. But uh, in my opinion, um, I didn't. I also didn't really like Besiktas to be to be honest. The midfield is really in shambles. Um, I thought that with the absence of Ljajic that you would have played better. But, you know, if you have to play Hutchinson, which is one of my favorite players, the guy is really old, you know, he, he, he has to, he, if he has to keep up with the pace, it's really a good good, good sign, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, all in all, a really good game for me. I, I, I would have hoped that Sturridge came on earlier and um, that he also made his mark, you know, at least scored a goal scored his first goal. He was really close with the with the free kick in the last minute. Um, but um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I know that uh, there were some positions like uh, in the first half, there was a free kick from Borak that uh, deflected off the wall and it, and it looked like it hit the arm of Serlo. But, you know, I'm not the man of the law. I don't really know the, the rules. It, it, to me, it looked like he, you know... <laughs> I, I thought looked, that would have been a very soft penalty. Personally. Yeah, to me it looked like he just, you know, he twists his body and the ball hit his upper arm, you know. Mm. Yeah, you can't yeah. really chop They off checked your it arm. with far. And I think that was like, that was one of the crucial moments of the match in the sense that, let's say Bishtesh get a penalty there. Because up until that point, up until actually the goal for Trabzonspor in the 31st minute, it was a very well balanced match. There was one really dangerous attack for Trabzonspor early on. Uh, where I think Anthony Nakoyemi just couldn't get to the ball to head it. And then there was one really good cross from Janner that, that was just missed by Olshan at the at the near post. I think if yeah, he yeah. makes contact with that, it's a goal. And really, it's it's kind of been the story of Besiktas' season in that sense of it, it all went okay up until they concede that first goal. And that first goal always seems to come, or well, not always, but like seems to come right relatively frequently around that 30 minute mark. It's when they seem to, I don't know what it is, a lapse of concentration or something. Um, I, I do think that the first goal for Trabzonspor, uh, you could say the second one, that's a significant amount of luck is involved there. But on the first goal, I think, you know, when you force a player to score an own goal, it's usually because you put a significant amount of pressure on that player to make uh, an interception or whatever, or to come in between to make a decision. And and that's basically what that was. Doro Khan was forced to head the ball, trying to clear it, and it wasn't a good header. He cleared it beyond his own goalkeeper into his own goal. So that's I don't think you can credit that to luck. But it is it is telling for Besiktas' season, really. And I do really think, you know, Besiktas fans... 
They're they're lashing out at the board. They're lashing out at, at at the players, at the coach. They're all trying to find someone to blame, which is what's a normal human reaction. You're trying to look for the source of the problem so that you can fix it. Because if you can find the problem, if you can identify the problem, you can fix it. But I think that the, the difficult and the hard truth that Besiktas fans maybe need to acknowledge and realize is there isn't one singular thing to point out at that is the problem, that is the problem. And I know it's gonna come across a little bit lame, but sometimes luck is all you need or a lack of luck is what makes the difference. I think here, again, these first two goals, that's a typical example of Murphy's Law. Everything that go, can go wrong will go wrong. And it's kind of been so the case throughout this season so far in every single game except for the, the the match against Gustepe which is the only match mind you where Besiktas got on the score sheet first and then they ended up winning that match 3-0 but in every other single game this season they conceded the first goal they've played seven official matches this season in six of those they conceded the first goal that's a big issue and a lot of those goals that they're conceding are coming from individual errors or coming from Dumb luck, almost. But I think the re the main issue Bishtech have had is they have a new coach. They have a lot of new players. They had a lot of injuries at the start of the season. Burak is only just back for his second game now. He's, he's a crucial player. They missed Leic here. Okay, Leic hasn't been good this season. But, I mean, still statistically, he hasn't been good. Still two goals, four assists. Has to be noted, too. You, and, and for a player like that to regain his form he needs to play so him missing this match that's another thing they've missed a lot of players due to injuries like Trouton Sport have of course lots of new components in a team with new players new coach all that and then you completely and utterly miss the start to your season which will cause the fact that your confidence is going to sink into your shoes and I think you're seeing a carbon copy of what happened to Fenerbahce last season because people, you know, throughout the season, people were, ah, uh, you know, Slimani is a bad player, and this guy is a bad player, and that guy is a bad player. Well, look at what Slimani is doing right now at Monaco. Look what he can do as a player when he's confident. Fenerbahce didn't have a bad team last season. I'm not saying they had a great team, and I'm not saying they could have won the title, but they had a team that should have always ended in the top five last season. There's no excuse for that. Same thing is the case right now with Besiktas. They may not be the best team in the league in terms of quality, but they are top five. With this team, they have to end top five, otherwise it's a failure. But just like Fenerbahce last season, they completely missed their start. They have a new coach that doesn't know how... That, I mean, he can't really... You can't... There isn't a magical injection of confidence that you can give players and confidence is at the end of the day in my opinion the most important factor in sports in, and especially in team sports and in football you can be outclassed by several levels and still get a result against a better team just because you're confident in your own ability and you know what to expect from your teammates it's all up in the head. I'm not obviously at the end of the day, confidence alone isn't going to win you the Champions League. It's not going to win you the league. It's not going to win you all that. You still need quality too, of course. But confidence is one of the absolute most important things in football. And Besiktas have none right now. I think that's the biggest difference with any other team at the moment. Besiktas aren't going to get a good result against Fenerbahce, against Galatasaray, against Trabzonspor. Teams who, especially Fenerbahce and Trabzonspor right now, who are confident in their own ability. And I think even Galatasaray, despite the fact that they aren't getting the results right now, they have a lot of quality players with a lot of experience and they all have confidence in their own uh, ability. And they know at the end of the day, we'll get the job done. I think that's one of the main things lacking with Besiktas right now. They don't really have those types of players. They brought in a lot of new, younger players, like mid-20s, whatever. But none of them are really, like, you know, they, they don't really have that experience at the moment. Uh, that that player is going to step up and drag them across the finish line. The only players that they do have that could do that are Leic and Burak. Burak only just got back from a really long injury, basically. He was basically out the entire preseason and then the, the beginning of the season. So he's been out, out for like two months. So he needs a little bit of time to get back into it. Then Adam Leic missed the entire preseason. He's played all the games in the league except for this one. But he clearly isn't 
up to it yet. So you need one or two players that are going to take this team on their back, and drag them across the finish line for a couple of matches against maybe easier opponents, get the team some confidence. It doesn't matter if you br if you fire Abdullah Afci right now. If the next coach is going to run into the same issue, this team's this team has a crucial lack of of, uh, of of confidence. Look at Fenerbahce Lassi when Ersun Yalan got brought in. That didn't change things straight away. It still took quite a while before they managed to somewhat turn things around. And I think it's the exact same thing for, for Bishtes here. And that's I know this isn't really about this match, but it is about this match because that's exactly what happened here again. I think what we're going to see for the foreseeable future with Bishtes, as long as it's nil-nil, there's going to be a chance, but they don't, they're they kind of struggling with creating goals. They're, they're definitely struggling with converting the, the few chances that they are creating. And then as soon as they concede, you know they're, the max they're going to be able to get from that match is a, is a draw right now. Because they don't have the confidence to go up and over an opponent at the moment. We saw that against Riza Spore, which was, I think, even their best, best performance overall. But that's just Bishnes are just lacking so much right now, and, and at the moment, I don't think they'll end bottom three at the end of the season. But you never know because when confidence spirals out of control, the entire team does everything. It's like a, a card house; it all plummets. So you can have a really decent team in terms of individual quality and still do really poorly. Um, that was my rant, but I, I think that's the biggest issue right now. What I can say for Basic Clash, I don't see a singular issue. People are blaming Abdullah Afci, but even though it's really fun for me, you know, to to shit on uh, to shit on Basic Clash, you know, because of one of my best friends is for Basic Clash. I, I, you know, I don't think it's like a like a one solution thing, you know. Um, Abdullah Afci has shown that he's a good he's a, he's a good coach. But I think that um, taking over a team from from Channel Gunnar is one of the best coaches in Turkish history, and you know a team that is that has really passionate fans and that always fights for the top, uh, you know, for the top three for the championships. And I I think it's really you know a lot of pressure on him. Um, I don't really think that uh, the players you got are really Beşiktaş worry to be honest. Diaby played a really good game. The the couple of minutes he got, like the like the second half, he was pretty good. Tyler Boyd, I just you know he's he's not best touch quality worthy. You know he, it's easy to um, to shine in a team as Ankara Gücü where you know you're not the best team, you're not the worst team, but you know it's easy to shine if you have the quality. You know a mid motor as as we say in Dutch. But you know you can't you can't do it if if, if a player like uh, Burak who is a really clinical player. He had a bad game yesterday. I I think that he he shouldn't be allowed to take any free kicks at all. You know he's kind of like Cristiano, where he, he he scores one in like 40, 40 attempts, and it's a great one. But everyone you know knows that he he probably won't score again. Yeah, but who was gonna take it yesterday? Light yeah, wasn't that's, there, that, so that, that's my second problem. You don't have anyone else. You know, Ozan is not the best. You know, Yice isn't Janner, there. Janner, I know. guess, could have taken it. Yeah, maybe Janner with a you know, but. I think I think the problem with with Bishop Clash is, is 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 multiple. You know, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. not one thing that you you know you can you can fire up loud, but that won't fix anything because who are who are you going to get in this place? You know, um, but yeah, exactly. Have, anyone have, taking the job right now needs you need to if you're gonna bring in anyone at the moment, you have to almost bring in like a Yilmaz Vural type or something. Because let's say because fan like Bishop fans would want Sergan, for example. He's been proving yeah. himself in recent years at, at you know Malatya Spor now, and he's proved himself at Alanya. He's proved himself at Antep, Kayseri, I believe. Uh, whatever. But if you bring him in right now, you're just basically throwing him in front of the Lions. What what the only. The, Okay, he can't do much worse, but you could look at it that way. But at the other hand, I think you're just giving him a very ungrateful job. Plus, I really don't think Abdullah Avci is to blame here. Uzar asked me the other day, like, where is he failing? But he, he's he been dealt such a, a, a bad hand. And yeah, you can say that maybe the, the players we got weren't necessarily Bishdash dash quality players. But I don't agree with that. I think a Tyler Boyd is easily on a similar level to what old Jai was when we first got him. The thing is that if you, you're putting you're slotting in all these new guys and you're expecting them to carry you straight away, but the rest of the team isn't working. And it's it's so 
it's so easy for fans to say, well, this guy's shit, that guy shit, that guy shit. But you're throwing these new players in an unfamiliar environment, in a team that's not working whatsoever, and you're expecting them to turn things around. That's just a wrong mindset. It doesn't work like that. Uh, that doesn't work like that when you get a Nunkudu who has barely played in four years. You get a, a Diaby who's being played out of position because he's a striker. You're getting a Tyler Boyd who's this is his first with at a top team. And then you're expecting those guys to make the difference. It's the wrong thing. We should have, basically should have guys like Leic, like Burak, like Ozhan. They should be standing up and lifting the team up to a newer level. You can expect a guy like Elneny, for example, because he's played at a top team in Switzerland with Basel because he's played in a top team at as Arsenal. You can expect a guy like that to come into the team and add something. But, well, you know, we all know what happened there. We got sent <laughs> off in his first match. He wasn't available. And obviously, you know, that midfield is a real issue, as you pointed out. And I think El Neni playing there could potentially slowly start helping towards a more stable Besiktas. But... I mean, I have. I can't say I've liked Dorkan this season. Um, I think he played good the first couple of man months last match, uh, last season. Sorry, he played good in those first couple of months, and he scored some goals and even pressed people, and then he started getting hyped and blown out of proportion. But he's not a special player. He's yeah, he works hard and all that, but he's not. A team like Bishta should be dominating midfield, should be controlling the match. Dorokhan doesn't work in function of that. Atiba, like you say, great player, but he's almost... What, what, Atiba is 36 years old. I wanted to say 38, but he's 36 years old. He's getting at the tail end of his career. And he was one of the best players on the pitch yesterday for Bishop Tish, but Yeah, yeah. But I mean, with, with Atiba, you know what you're going to get. A lot of ball recuperations and lateral passes, but that's not what Besiktas need right now. Besiktas need to get in the final third of their opponents and they need to do so quickly. And you, the only way to do that, and the only way to do that is with forward passes, quick forward passes, not taking too long, not being too uh, tedious about it and making quick combinations. And like you said, you know, Burak wasn't really good yesterday, but what, what can you really expect from him? You know, he's being... He's basically being f thrown out there. He's like, okay, you're you're fit again. We need you. Get out there. And he does. He doesn't have any time to pick up any sort of a form or anything like that. So we're gonna have to wait a couple of weeks before we see the best of him. But Bishop don't have a couple of weeks. Yeah, that's the problem. You know, there were there, there was one big chance he had, like that he was that he that he um, got the ball in this, you know, in the, in the box, and it was like one on one with the keeper, but he just. He, he put it down with his chest, but he couldn't hit the ball at all. You know that, as a player, uh, you know, as a person that has watched Brock back in the day before he came, you know, the player that he is today, you know, back back in 2010, those seasons, he's he's really clinical. You know, I know that um, it, it, it's a fun thing to talk about how many times he's an offside, but if you give him like a one-on-one -on -one chance with uh, with the keeper, it's like it's, it's pretty much a goal always. You know, so um, yeah, fifty-fifty. Yeah, you know, you can you can't really you can't really blame as I said, you can't really blame a certain thing, you know. Uh, I I do have to give, give uh, you know, we have to give a little bit of props to the team uh, to Trabzonspor, for, you know. They finally um after the game in the, in the Europa League, they really didn't have any the, the the formation that they had on paper didn't really match the one that was on the field. But today um Obi Mikel um is just Keeping, it just keeps getting better and better and better. He keeps, you know, blocking the pass lanes. He's, he's really pretty yeah, much and, everywhere. And Hussein and Husseini, who you pointed out, doesn't yeah. get enough credit. He had a great match. They really yeah. locked up Burak basically the entire match. And the way that the Nkutu basically got locked down for the majority of the match. He had a couple of really good moments. I think he had like a really good cross in the second half that Burak barely missed. Yep. Uh, Nukudu had a, had a couple of good moments and then as you said Diaby had some good moments but all in all if you look at the injuries Trabzonspor have the players they're missing and still the match they managed to put forward because I, like I said you know the first 30 minutes or so were evenly matched um, but Trabzonspor had their moments in, in those first 30 minutes too and they never panicked you know I think even like let's say that that's Burak shoots that free kick in or, or they get a penalty and they score. 
I don't think Tra Trabzon will be faced by that, and that's the that's the main difference because Besiktas do get faced as soon as they concede. It's over. They because they no, have absolutely no confidence in themselves right now. I you mean, know? generally, troubles for do have a problem after conceding that they, you know, uh, I don't think I, I don't know if it's if it's uh, if it's coming from higher up, you know, if it's uh, a problem with uh, you know Faraman or the or the players, but um, as in you know they 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 really slouch a little bit after after conceding, and you always see that at troubles for, which is kind of annoying, but. The games at home, the games at home are just really different, you know. The the, the supporters have um, have been going to the matches in mass, you know, for the last couple of, couple of years, and pretty much every home match is, is is near of a sellout, you know. So it's it's really hard to play play in Trabzon, you know, with the, the humidity and uh, all the screaming fans and all the you know all the chaos that surrounds the game. That always has a has a pretty has a pretty good uh, good effect for Trabzon and a bad effect for the opponent, you know. So even though uh, when we play out, when we play away, uh, we have a lot of supporters that also join. But we we also generally have a problem, you know, with uh, with lack uh, with with uh, with a lack of concentration after getting a goal, conceding a goal. But you know, as I said, at home, I don't think those things will happen. And um, you know, the, the the main point was pretty much that the team, you know, kept the formation. They didn't really slouch off. I I, I looked at a heat map of the game after the game. And it was pretty much how it was supposed to be. Normally, we have a problem with Abdelkader Farmak, you know, trying to join the attack a lot. But um, he didn't this game because every time he does, he, there's a big void in the midfield and the opponent can really, you know, easily take advantage of that. But, um, yeah, as I said, I, um, you know, Bishklash is going through some hard times. I know that uh, as a Trabzon Sport fan, we had the same stuff happening last year. Um, I remember a game, I think the Europa League game that you guys had where the supporters were chanting for Sergen to come back. I'm not really a fan of, you know, oh, having club course. legends return, even though it, it, it seems to work out, you know, Karaman at the moment. we I saw it with Hami at, uh, at Trap the Sport, with Shota, with Tolona. It's, it's, it's kind of bad if you, you know, a player that everyone liked back in the days and if you bring him in and he doesn't have any... He doesn't have any, you know, victories and good good matches. That at the end of the day, you're going to hate him, you know. Yeah, it tarnishes um, tarn tarnishes their legacy, and that's yeah, the last thing you want. Yeah, in you know, you, when 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 I think of Sergen, I think of the you know the wonderful free kicks, his punditry on on air, and I pretty much think that the Bish Clash fans are all, all already thinking about stuff like those. You know, if he comes if he comes to coach the team. But you don't want to you want you don't want to screw his legacy up a, a bit, you know. With a team like Bechtel, it's really hard to have a you know have a good team going, you know, because you're you're fighting with the finances, you're fighting with you know having having huge personalities, you're fighting with the with the pressure that uh, that the supporters, that the fan fans as uh, as Charles Enzo have on the team. It's really it's really a hard uh, really a hard uh, job to fulfill, you know. Um, but you know, it is it is pretty much the ebb and flow of, of Turkish football. Every 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 so every couple of years, a, a team that's that is, that is traditionally a part of the top four just fucks up for a couple of years, and there comes a new manager or a new uh, president, and it pumps the money in. It goes good for two years, and you know it's just a cycle. Um, yeah, yeah, but that's the thing know, that doesn't really work anymore in the financial fair play era where you can't just come and pump in a lot of money. Okay, I, I mean, I know there's ways around that we've seen that we're seeing at the Fenerbahce right now where Ali Coach is finding ways to pump money into the club, you know. Um, but still, it, it's not as it once was. And, it, and yeah. it's not like the, the down periods we're seeing now, for example, Fenerbahce last season and now Bishop right now. Obviously, there's still a long way to go. There's still 28 matches left in the season. But I I don't think Bishtish can just turn this around. I think they're heading for a similar season to Fenerbahce last season and potentially even worse. I mean, they have less points right now than Fenerbahce had last season it's, uh, after six games. I believe Fener had six points after six matches last season and Bishtish now have five, uh, which is their worst start 
to the season since well i know last week their worst start was since 2001 but i'm pretty sure that we had more points in 2001 after six games so um it's it's really poor at the moment i don't see any light at the end of the tunnel at the moment um and i don't know what you exactly meant by the issue of, of personalities because i actually think the problem that they have is that they perhaps lack some personalities I th- like I said before, I think they're lacking some players that can stand up and take that team on their backs. Like a Sosa at Trabzonspor for right now, for example. You'd ex- like I said, you'd expect Leic to do it, but yeah. No, the the, the, the way I meant it, you know, um, uh, there, every team has a couple of players that can fuck up, you know, the team chemistry by doing, you know, by having bad bad decisions during games. Um, before Quaresma went away, he was one of those players that, you know, it was a ticking time bomb, you know. Um, I think, uh, you know, I saw, uh, I don't know if you saw it, there was a couple of, there was a little bit of commotion between uh, Burak and Sosa yesterday, you know, stuff like that. I know that it sometimes works works in their favor of the team, you know, that uh, it brings everyone together to fight a common goal, so to say. But having a player like, having a player like Burak or Janer at the left back, even though he seems to, be, he, sees, he seems to have calmed down a bit, you know, he's, you, you have to, you have to have a captain that is like, you know, cut the shit. Don't don't fight it every time. You know, don't cry, don't cry, don't go for this, don't go for that. Just play your game. You know, and that is what. Yeah, but now I think you're looking a little bit more at the history of the players because I don't think that Burak has shown that at Besiktas so far. He's not been an issue. Um, he's definitely not been a, a, a poor impact on the dressing room. I, I think okay. the same can be said about the general right now. I don't think that that's one of the problems the business don't have right now. One of the few problems they don't have right now. Um, but okay. we spent plenty of time on speaking on Trabzonspor Bishiktesh and mainly, of course, about the woes <laughs> Bishiktesh are going through. Uh, Jakob, you're just joining us for this short segment, uh, of course, because you have some stuff to do this week. Thank you very much for shedding your light on the Trabzonspor's match. And good luck in the Europa League this week. And hopefully uh, Bishiktesh uh, can get a result at home against Wolves. I'm really dreading that match. Uh, but we're moving on now to Monday results. And then finally on Monday, our final match of match day six was Gazi Yantep Football Club. That's the new name of Gazi Shahir. Newsflash, they changed their name officially from Gazi Shahir to Gazi Yantep Football Club. Um, but for this match, it was still Gazi Shahir, but we will henceforth <laughs> just refer to them as Gazi Yantep. And they played Gustepe. This match ended 1-1 goals here coming from Guray Voral in the 58th minute after Beto got sent off. The Gustepe goalkeeper got sent off in the 50th minute for handling the ball outside of the box. Very dumb move by Beto. So eight minutes later, Guray Voral finally put Gaziantep, Sport, Gaziantep Football Club 1-0 up. Uh, that was deserved, I felt like, but uh, Umut will tell us a little bit more in a bit. But then in the end, Berkan Emir with a wayward cross salvages a point for Gustepe. It kind of reminded me a little bit of that uh, John Karu goal in the Champions League back in 2001. Um, but I'm going back really, really far right now. Umut, tell us a little bit more about the final match of match day six in the Turkish Super League. Well, uh, it was a great game, to be honest, because the first half was uh, just boring, but second half was full of mysteries, you know. The game was balanced before the red card incident, after a long ball uh, behind the Gustape defense. Uh, they were slow and all, and ball bounced right in front of Beto, but who was also in his box, and he couldn't reach it uh, because of his height and handled it to prevent the goal, but I think a goalkeeper of his caliber and experience should have done better there, because, you know, uh, and he handled the ball and sent off after that around 50th minute uh, for Gerstepe, and young Göktu went into the goal, and he had, uh, so, he doesn't have so much experience, to be honest, but... And not too much after that, a cross from Gurai Vral just bounced, bounced in front of Göktu and went into the net for a Gazi Shihir, and it should be referred Gazi, Gazi Antep Feka, I don't know. Uh, and this goal brought them into the lead, and after that goal, uh, Gazi Antep, uh, they dropped back to secure their lead uh, and three points, also hoping for a counter-attack in front of Gustave, but uh, I think Tamartuna has 
to give some explanation about the, how Gestapo defense is so bad and cannot defend at all because Gazi Shehir missed too many chances, especially inside the second half, as Gustav brought their defensive line higher up, hoping for, uh, hoping to find a goal there. But defensive play wasn't their priority anymore, and Gazi Shehir found too many gaps and open chances. I don't believe how they did they miss all of those chances with Mohamed Demir and all uh, their African strikers. They missed too many chances in front of goal tap-ins just inches away from the empty net and we shall say the golden rule of football Atamayana Atarla eventually if you miss these kind of chances you're gonna concede and at 82nd minute Berk and Emir as you told before the left back scored a magnificent goal which reminded me of Haji's goal against Colombia at the time uh, from the similar kind of point uh, to the back post. Maybe he crossed it or maybe he shot it. But I think he shot it because he was looking like preparing to hit it, uh, like going to strike it with with a power. And I think that's the goal of the week for me after Ivan John's goal uh, this week. And after conceding, Ga- Gaziantep went to uh, attacking philosophy once again, but missed many chances once again and if Gazishehir, Gaziantep was a bit more careful in front of goal they could win the game rather really rather easily uh, and any issues at all but lo- looking at the lineup you would think Gustave would be a good position team with a passing play with players such as Castro, Mossoro, Soner Aido but we haven't seen it yet. They have also pacey wingers who can run past the opponents like uh, Halilak Bunar or like Sarah. Yeah, Sardar, uh, Yasin if you can if you can add him as well. Mm-hmm. But they couldn't never work it out. So Yeah. They're probably the only team worse than Bishiktas right now. Also, uh, at the end of the game there was a seven minute of additional time mm-hmm. at the end. Uh, which was definitely a nightmare for Gustape to play with 10 men and a youngster goalkeeper in their goal. And uh, yeah. I think their height uh, as a team is lower than uh, expected as well. And it's really hard to for them to defend all those crosses and all. And yeah. eventually game ended 1-1, which is a letdown for Galshir and a golden point for Gustape for that kind of play. Yeah, Gaziantep will be kicking themselves after that draw. They should have always won this match, especially against 10 man. But uh, yeah, obviously they're in a good position in the league. Uh, Burak, could you uh, quickly go over the league standings following match day six, please? Absolutely. So at the top, Alanya Sport is still top. Um, second is Fenerbahce, third, Gaziantep, Gaziantep Football Club. Both on 11 points, but Fenerbahce ahead on both goal difference and the head-to-head. Um, then in fourth place, Sivaspor, fifth, Konya, and sixth, Galatasaray. Actually, Galatasaray and Trabzon are on the same points, both on nine points there. And if we look at the bottom, you've got Genshtar Belia propping up in 18th with two points, Kayseri in 17th with three points, and then Besiktas in 16th with five points. And just ahead of them, you have Gustepe and Kasim Pasha. So, not much change with the bottom two. Besiktas dropping in there after the, the loss to Trabzon and teams around them picking up points like Gustave Kasan Pasha um, and Ankara Guju. And that is the standings at the end of uh, match day six. Yeah, and it, re- it really feels like Fenerbahce were after last season, like, oh, I bet none of you can do worse than that. And Besiktas were just like, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's uh, look quickly at the fixtures for next week. We have Malatya Spor, Denizli Spor, and Fenerbahce Antalya Spor on Friday. On Saturday, we have Kasim Pasha against Konya Spor, Gustepe Kayseri Spor, Genj Terverli, and Galatasaray. And then on Sunday, we have Siva Spor against Ankara Gujo, Besiktas Alanya Spor. That's a one to watch. Gaziantep, Spor, Gaziantep Football Club, Bashak here, And finally, the Black Sea Derby. Rizespor, Trabzonspor. So that's it for next week. 
Well, anyway, guys, thank you very much for joining me uh, once again for Football Alter and thank you listeners for listening. And let's not forget Ikido do Burak, Ikido do Burak. Happy birthday, my friend. Happy birthday. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the best, best, best birthday ever present you can give me is by keeping on listening to Football Al Turca and letting us know what you'd like us to discuss. And as you said, uh, Khan, you would pick Vedat Muric to go into your side, um, a player from any other team. At this moment in time, my choice from any of any team to come into the Fenerbahce team would be Anthony Nwakayeme of Trabzonspor. Oh, man. Oh, actually, uh, maybe Enzonzi. I don't know. Ah, uh, ah, uh, difficult. He was really good against Pesce yesterday, I felt. And he was also really good against Fenerbahce. And he's starting to come into his own. Um, but yeah, Vedat and, and, and Enzonzi both. If I can have two, I'll take those, please. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, that'll be it for me. <laughs> <laughs> in your dreams yeah anyway goodbye people we'll see you again next week bye 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 bye